Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. You'll hear from our other Tyler in just a moment, Tyler Calvaruso, recruiting insider, does a great job also covering the transfer portal for both basketball and football. And we have things to talk about in both of those realms because Penn State Hoops on a Thursday here, uh, picking up a Big Ten transfer. And of course, the football program in pursuit of some pieces that can maybe help them take a step forward toward the college football playoff. Uh, what can they add at this point in the year it remains to be seen. We saw a ton of spring games occurring across the college football landscape this Saturday. So the idea here is once we get past that point, you're going to see the floodgates open a bit more with names going into the portal. Another one has gone in for the Penn State Nittany Lions, Malik Mega. Uh, that was on Tuesday evening. That one popped up. We spoke at length about Keandre Lambert Smith's official entrance into the transfer portal on our Monday episode, which featured Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallen. But uh, within 48 hours of that, we had Malik Mega, another fifth year wide receiver. He took a red shirt on like Keandre Lambert Smith. So he was a red shirt senior with COVID eligibility still available to him in 2025. Emerged as a special teams captain for Penn State uh, last year. However, his role really has been relegated to special teams. He's had some injury issues along the way, but offensively not able to break through. Nine career catches through four years on campus. Uh, he's a guy that played fewer than 50 total offensive snaps uh, last season in eight appearances on offense. Uh, so Malik Mega going to go try to finish his career elsewhere. He's a guy that's going to be remembered very well here on campus. Uh, somebody who, like I said, earned team captaincy, but one of the more intriguing guys they've brought in, tested off the charts as a high school prospect up in Montreal, in Quebec, Canada. He was the top player from that province back in the 2020 cycle, um, arrived here with the ability to speak four languages and really flourished here at Penn State in a lot of ways, unfortunately not at the receiver spot. So a couple departures from the receiver position. Let's talk about what may be coming in for the Nittany Lions from the transfer portal. We do that now with Tyler Calvaruso. Tyler, set the stage there a little bit just to bring folks up to speed. I think everyone was well aware of what has happened because there hasn't been a frenzy of news to this point. I thought by the time we might get to this Thursday episode, and just for, for reference here, we're recording at 1 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, April 18th. Things could change in a hurry. But to this point, it's been relatively you know, quiet or, or veering on quiet here, coming out of the Lash building. And really, I think overall across college football, it's still a bit of a waiting game for what's going to happen when spring practices close in different corners of America this upcoming weekend. Yeah, it's been pretty tame, right? You know, not that many big names entering yet, not that big wave that we have seen every single winter portal cycle. So it's been a little bit slower. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier, you know, as some of these spring games wind down and spring exit meetings across the nation take place, you're probably going to see, you know, more guys decide to see greener pastures and see what is out there for them in the portal. Now, will those be a ton of big names or will they be more of those, you know, depth pieces, younger guys who are highly rated recruits who got a little bit buried in the depth chart and want to try and work their way back into the equation elsewhere. We're going to have to wait and see, but from our side here covering Penn State, you know, it's been pretty tame. Only the two entries, you know, not a whole lot popping up in terms of potential names of interest yet. And that's the important prefaces yet, because as more guys hit the portal, there's going to be an uptick in interest. There are going to be some names that catch this staff. So I'm, we've already seen that here on Thursday morning with a new name working its way into the equation. So uh, it's an ever evolving thing and we're going to be keeping an eye on it. But right now it's been a slow start to this uh, second portal season. Well, we know that NIL dollars are being discussed and potentially thrown around in big doses here during the spring portal window. Uh, Keandre Lambert-Smith, by the way, has visits scheduled to Texas A&M. Auburn, you wonder what the open market might look like for him. He's been evaluated by many to this point as one of the top wide receivers on the market. We expect that wide receiver market to change and evolve and, and, and expand in the upcoming days, though. Uh, but ultimately, look, there's a lot of money in play here. And if you want a seat at the table on a lot of the conversations, one of the things you need to bring to that conversation is a financial package. And Penn State, uh, with some news on Thursday morning, announcing Retain the Roar. It's a campaign to raise 500 grand, uh, quote, to ensure championship level talent uh, to the Penn State football roster. So it, it, this, as you might hear from the Retain the Roar title, Roster retention, a huge thing. We speak so much about going out and getting the big fish out there available from other programs, other campuses. Well, 
a lot of the battle right now that college football coaches and athletic administrators are dealing with is keeping your talent intact on your roster. And if a top 10 team like Penn State, a blue blood in college football, is fighting this battle, imagine what it looks like down a few rungs of the ladder right now in the college football scene. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that factor uh, with Brandon Short a little bit later here on the show. He'll follow Tyler Calvaruso. Not only is he a former All-American linebacker with the Nittany Lions, but of course he serves on the board of trustees here at Penn State now. He's actively engaged in what the athletic future is looking like, what they're trying to prepare for. So we got some questions for him. He's running for re-election on the board of trustees. Uh, we have a conversation upcoming. You'll hear that in a moment. But Tyler, I kind of set the stage for you now in saying, how much are you hearing about NIL being at the forefront of these discussions and really at the forefront of why some guys are hitting the portal in the first place? Yeah, I think it has to be at the you know a part of every single conversation that takes place when you're talking about guys in the portal and potential targets in the portal. Because, I mean, you also have to take into account, you know, this spring window, you know, the guys who are in right now, they might not necessarily be the biggest names, but we're getting up on crunch time for a lot of these programs when it comes to finding, you know, quick fixes for glaring needs on the roster. And we're talking about teams that want to compete for a spot in the college football playoff on the hunt to fill these holes before fall camp rolls around. And when that happens, you know, sometimes guys who, you know, maybe would have been a little bit lesser of a portal prospect during the winter cycle, given some of the bigger names that went in. Now they are one of the top names on the market. And, you know, that tend to drive up the NIL price. That's kind of just the name of the game at this point. So, yeah, NIL is definitely, uh, you know, part of every conversation that needs to be had when it comes to transfer portal recruiting. It's a case in high school recruiting. It's going to be the case in portal recruiting moving forward. You know, Penn State is prepared to deal with that for the top guys that decides it wants to go after. You know, the staff knows what the game is all about at this juncture with the way things are in the college football landscape, and they're going to be prepared to compete and, you know, make competitive offers where they deem necessary. It's all going to come down to fit for this staff, as it always does during the portal. You know, Terry Smith talked about, you know, recruiting guys in the locker room, you know, making sure that everyone's on board. And when you go outside of your locker room, you want to make sure – that you're bringing in players who fit the culture of your program and fit what you're building towards. That's an important aspect of every single portal pursuit Penn state really dives into. So it's NIL, it's culture, it's on and off the field fit. It's a lot of different things and a lot of stones that this staff does not leave unturned when it comes to doing their due diligence on a guy and decide if they really, really want to get involved with him and his camp. Ever since the transfer portal debuted back in 2018, James Franklin has repeatedly hammered home the point that they prefer to deal with players out there in the transfer portal who they have history with, uh, at least the history with maybe with maybe the supporting staff or, or 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 the high school coach, but preferably a history with that player where they were engaged with them as a prospect, whether or not they actually targeted them in high school is a different story. And to what degree Chop Robinson was a high value target. Arnold Abikade was not. They both ended up being all Big Ten defensive ends for Penn State out of the transfer portal. But I think ultimately right now with limited window, we're talking about now three and a half months, even less than that, to when this team's back in pads for preseason camp, Tyler. You know that they are prepared for, for guys who may be venturing into the portal soon. It feels like that right now is the approach at receiver, an obvious priority. I wrote a column about this on Sunday. I updated it on Monday when Keandre Lambert-Smith officially jumped in the portal. It's a clear need for this team, a top of the line wide receiver, if they feel like right now they have concerns of the position. And, you know, internally, I think they would like help, but it's got to be the right kind of help, Tyler. This is not an add a body situation. They have a lot of bodies. That's not the problem. This is an add an alpha guy. This is an add an established guy. And it feels like right now, based on what we're hearing and what we're seeing and what we're not seeing to this point, maybe a bit of a waiting game to see when that kind of guy who they check off those kind of boxes for shows up in the portal and they can present a real sales pitch. You know, Penn State would love to go out and add a top flight wide receiver to his gym, to its depth chart before the beginning of fall camp. Right. But the problem with that isn't I put problem in quotes when I wrote about this morning, because it's not necessarily a problem. It's kind of just reality. Yeah. Penn State wants to go get a top receiver. So do 20 other programs. You know, there's going to be 20 other, other programs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So they're going to be, you know, no matter what, prospect they decide to get involved with there's going to be some pretty fierce competition and i do think it's going to be a little bit of a waiting game because i mean quite frankly i'm going to be honest if you go look at some of these names in the portal right now here on thursday 
there are some nice fits, you know, potential nice fits when you look at skill set, prior production at their previous school. There are some guys who definitely, you know, maybe come in and help the room. But if you look at it, is there really that potential true number one who could really come in, take over your wide receiver depth chart, be that top option for Drew Aller in the offense? I'm not quite sure. So, you know, maybe that guy pops up in the portal a little bit later in this window. Maybe it never comes and Penn State is going to have to look at some of those guys who will just be nice additions, may not be true wide receiver ones, but can help your room nonetheless. And there's obviously value in that. It kind of goes without saying. The desire is to add, you know, a potential wide receiver one. But if you could go out and get a guy who could help your room in any way, that's a plus. But when it comes to those top flight guys, yeah, I think it might be a little bit of a waiting game. We're going to have to see what comes about on that front, but not a ton of star power in the portal position right now. Yeah, and I believe, and and I could double check on this quickly, but I, I think last I checked, Keandre Lambert Smith was the number one or number two overall wide receiver. I know Sam Brown out of Houston He's also in. there, but Keandre Lambert Smith was the number one or number two guy in wide receiver transfer rankings at twenty four seven Sports. Again, expecting some dramatic changes to who's available on that list by this time next week, or by next Monday, or by next Sunday, even. But that kind of shows you where the market is. The, the guy that a lot of Penn State fans just saw walk away and said, well, he's not a true number one anyways. Well, a lot of people right now view him as maybe the number one wide receiver out there available. And so we'll see who else shows up and who else is there. Um, but but I think, you know, that that's kind of where it stands now. Is there anything else for you to add at the, at the receiver front at this stage? You know, not really. It's kind of I'm in wait and see mode regarding who enters the portal and where Penn State decides to go with its pursuits. I think, you know, at this point, and this goes for not just wide receiver, but really every position, it's, you know, weathering the storm and making sure those quote unquote surprise portal entries don't happen yeah. to your program, you know, recruiting the guys in the locker room, as we just touched on right now, from what we've been able to gather and trust me, there's been plenty of asking around going on since the portal opened, you know, doesn't sound like Penn State is necessarily expecting any significant departures. Now, you know, the portal window is open until the end of the month. So can that change? Sure. You know, that's uh, it's such a fluid thing, the transfer portal. It's always there's always something going on. So it's going to be something that we monitor pretty closely. But as of right now, the feedback we receive is, you know, Penn State is not necessarily anticipating or expecting any significant departures. And that's obviously a plus if that could hold true through the remainder of the month. That'd be a pretty big win for Penn State. But that's where things stand right now. I know some some things we picked up on uh, Wednesday night were that movement will happen. That's naturally going to happen. I, yeah. I got a few different positions here, but we're talking about more attrition movement, which is you know the common kind of departures we've seen from Penn State. What you want to see if you're this Penn State staff, and certainly if you're a Penn State fan, one of the listeners out there, is when that transfer portal closes and May 1st arrives, you wake up and everybody that you thought was going to play a big role leaving spring ball is still there to play a big ball, a, a big role when you get back on the field for preseason camp. And, you know, the label of surprise portal entry may come across a little bit different for the Penn State staff who's aware of inner workings mm -hmm. and maybe some of the tug of wars going on uh, with some key players perhaps over the last few days and, and maybe in the next week or so. Uh, versus what a surprise would look like to a Penn State fan who just kind of thinks if you're a first or second teamer, you're sticking around. So it's the reality of college football. James Franklin has sounded the alarm in the past. He's talked about tampering. So has Pat Kraft. Um, so there are a lot of talented players on Penn State's roster here. Uh, and, and the goal is to just move forward, get to May 1st and, and have those guys still on board. And I think by the time you get there, there will be some of the more obvious names. I guess if you were to look at the roster right now, project the depth chart. Some of the more obvious names probably make that move to the exit. But if you can avoid, as you said, a surprise, that's a win for Penn State. That's a win for any program right now in college football uh, in the foreseeable future until they get this thing cleaned up a little bit more and get some guardrails in place. Tyler, the, the couple other positions that have surfaced here early on in the transfer window uh, are on defense, uh, one of which uh, is linebacker. And this was something that we were considering uh, coming in out of the uh, blue-white weekend, 
you know, Kavion Keys, I'm sorry, uh, Keon Wiley, redshirt sophomore that they think very highly of, was banged up at the end of spring ball. We didn't get a chance to see him there in blue white action, though. I know he was producing some buzz for what he could do as a box linebacker earlier in camp. So with his absence and, and what that might look like if, if it's extended, you start to work your way through the depth chart and you feel really good. And I know the staff feels really good about what's at the top of that depth chart with Kobe King, Tony Rojas, Don DeLuca has a ton of experience. And then what's kind of budding along the way uh, with Tamir Robinson, KV on keys, Tyler Elston has played a lot of football for you. He's a guy who's in year five on campus, but I think Tyler, this is an area that when you think about the injuries, the physicality of this position and just the being realistic about what you might get out of this freshman class with Kari Jackson, who missed you know, most of his senior season with an injury. And then Anthony Speck, who's coming to campus here this summer, there is some sense to add a piece who can add some competitive depth for you. And that can be part of the conversation in 2025 and maybe even beyond. Yeah. You know, Abdul Carter's move down to defense is then it took a highly capable player out of that linebacker room and into the defensive line room. And, you know, some of Penn state's depth at the position just happens to be of the younger variety. So that does open the door for the exploration of depth of, at the linebacker position in the portal. You know, from conversations I've had before, I've been able to gather, it's a matter of how do we go out and make the linebacker depth chart better ahead of fall camp as opposed to, oh, my God, if this guy gets hurt or that guy gets hurt, we're in trouble. What are we going to do? we got to go get someone. So it's all about just stockpiling that quality depth and going out and seeing what it can accomplish in the portal. And Elijah Herring, the Tennessee transfer, is a name that has popped up here on Thursday. Highly productive backer in the SEC as a sophomore, more than 70 tackles. He's a Tennessee native, so he decides to stay in-state for the first two years of his collegiate career. You know, he's uh, It's going to be interesting to see what SEC programs get involved with him. Penn State is involved. Pittsburgh is involved. And, you know, it just sounds like overall linebacker is going to be a dis- – it's going to be part of the discussion – when it comes to the transfer portal moving forward, you know, they just want to see what's out there for them when it comes to adding quality depth of position. A guy could really fit into this room and thrive in Tom Allen's scheme. And it seems like Elijah Herring is the first name to pop up in that regard. I first heard of Herring's name this morning from our Tennessee site. They mentioned it to me. And, you know, we went on to confirm that Penn State has, you know, there's been involvement there on that. And so definitely want to keep an eye on moving forward. Other linebackers potentially as well. Going to have to see what comes about on that front and again you know this is uh it's kind of an overarching theme i think every time there's a portal window open penn state's going to go out and see what it could get at positions even if there is talent on board or position they're going to see what's out there they're going to see if there's a fit we're seeing that with herring and maybe some other linebackers as well yeah when you brought up the name herring earlier just did, did a little digging and, and our uh tennessee site at 24 7 sports does a great job covering their team uh, as do all of our team sites and, and just when he entered the portal kind of figuring out maybe why and and and, and what was going on a couple of things that popped up to me one he's he's coming off of a situation where he missed uh spring ball due to an injury um so so he hasn't been on the field for, for a while um you know, that's just something that any team is going to be monitoring where he is right now um under he went under underwent offseason surgery no specifics on that but two years of remaining eligibility he was kind of thrust into that starting role at tennessee last year because of an injury to a veteran ahead of him on, on the depth chart i don't think they they planned for him to be a first teamer as a sophomore um but that veteran is now back and according to the tennessee site probably projected to return to the starting lineup i don't know what that means for the snap count and and, and the role that that herring would look like as a junior here but uh, just a couple factors there in terms of where he's coming from, from a production standpoint and, and, and an involvement standpoint, and also where he is from a medical standpoint, which is something that will be need, needed to be cleared up by whichever program is going to bring him on board next. Yeah. And, you know, that's part of it. You know, it comes down to assessing the health situation and, you know, determining is he going to be healthy and able to help us in fall camp. You know, I think that that's something that also plays a part in every single portal pursuit, pursuit as well. You know, what is the guy's medicals? Is he good to go? Because, you know, there are some guys who enter the portal after being banged up in the spring. Herod's situation, it seems like he's going to be good to go no matter where he lands. So that's a plus. But, you know, again, it, the important thing here for Penn State is, first of all, you got to get him to campus for a visit. You know, that's something that's being worked on. We're going to have to see if that comes about. So, if Herring is a target or, you know, a legitimate target who winds up making it to campus for Penn State moving forward, I think it'd be a really solid addition to the room. I do. And I think that it's just one of those moves 
that could probably heighten the ceiling of Tom Allen's defense in 2024. I think the more quality backers you have on board, especially one who has that legitimate SEC game experience, it could really, you know, he has a track record of production at a pretty high level of football. That's always a boon to your defense and really anyway. Herring a name to monitor for now. We'll see if it's more than that. You'll find it on, on our coverage at lines247.com. Uh, already a couple SEC transfers uh, on board for Penn State's defense here at the cornerback spot. And Jalen Kimber, who spent last season with the Florida Gators as a starter. And then A.J. Harris, who spent his freshman year uh, last fall at, with the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, one of the first names that really came out in terms of Penn State interest externally, uh, it was Rene Conga uh, over at Rutgers. Um, he comes by way of Canada. Penn State's had a lot of success, relatively speaking, uh, compared to most college programs in recruiting uh, north of the border. Uh, Theo Johnson, of course, the latest uh, NFL product out of the program to get that chance. Jesse Lucetta, Jonathan Sutherland have made it to NFL rosters from Canada by way of Penn State. Um, and now another name to know here in Conga, um, again, spent the last four years in Piscataway he's one of those end of year kind of end of career kind of pickups on the transfer portal and this one's a little more puzzling because this is a defensive lineman and we've spent a lot of time this spring Tyler discussing just how deep that unit looks whether you go in the interior where they had a couple guys opt in for six years and Devon Elise and uh and Akeem Beeman and then a defensive end where you've got Abdul Carter shuffling over there you've got a, a plenty of veterans in play here so he told Alan True of 24-7 Sports, one of our uh, national recruiting analysts, or I'm sorry, I don't know if he said it directly, but Alan True was able to report based on conversations that Penn State is among programs he was in discussions with about playing a trip. Texas A&M was a, apparently going to be the first suitor up uh, on the itinerary. But two-parter here, uh, Big Ten player, defensive line, not too far away, kind of familiar ground here. What do you make of the interest? And then ultimately, what do you make of the interest at this position area in particular? Yeah, I think that kind of familiarity you just touched on, I think that helps Penn State, you know, kind of garner the interest here. You know, again, Big Ten country, so he's familiar with the conference. He's familiar with the level of competition, you know, the physicality of playing in the trenches in the Big Ten. So I think that's something that could, you know, kind of play into his level of interest in Penn State. When it comes to the Penn State side of the equation, Defensive tackle is a position that, you know, we've always looked at and you look at the depth chart and you laid out all the names. You're like, oh, wow, they're really set on the interior. You know, they just signed a big class on the interior too. So the bodies are very much in place. And, you know, the thought is the talent is very much in place as well. You know, this might be more of a move that you kind of look at 2025 a little bit because, you know, Conga has that eligibility. And the fact of the matter is, you know, some of these guys aren't going to be back during the 2025 season. So if you can go out and get a guy who can help you, not only 2024, but the following season as well, that's probably a pretty big plus from Penn State's standpoint. So an eye on the immediate and an eye on the future as well when it comes to Rene Congo. Man, the COVID eligibility got me again, dude. Yeah. You're right. He does, he does, he does have at eligibility. First, I said the same thing at first. I was wondering the same thing because I'm like, I thought he only had one year. But then I looked and I was like, oh, nope. He's got uh, we, get, we still have seventh year guys in college football, so I shouldn't be assuming anything. But uh, this is a situation where Conga, I, I went back and read through that Rutgers bio, came to campus in 2020. Everybody got a red shirt that year. 2021 was so technically his freshman year. He only played two games, so he actually got a red shirt that year. So he could use a six year. Right now, you can view him as a red shirt senior. But he's got a redshirt senior with uh, another, like just like Elise used, just like Beeman used. He can yep. do that in 2025. But this is not a proven commodity. I mean, I, I know that he's been around a while, but you look over his career, he hasn't been a mainstay in the starting lineup for Rutgers. He played in 10 games last year. He had two tackles for loss. He had a sack. So um, this is one where you'd really be relying on your staff connections your projection of what he would be a fit for you rather than being like, here's all the film he's accrued in big 10 action. Clearly he's a baller. We've got to add him. Um, but you know, this is, there's all different varieties of targets you could find in, in the, in the transfer portal. And maybe he falls in a different category. This just one on the surface initially, it doesn't make a ton of sense. It doesn't. But again, you know, it comes back to kind of what I said earlier about the overarching theme of the portal. The staff sees either upside or fit in a guy in mm -hmm. whatever way that may be. They're going to explore it. Maybe it leads them somewhere. Maybe it doesn't. 
you know, something we, we've seen this really since the transfer portal became what it was. You'll see Penn State or another program be heavily involved with the guy at the start. You know, oh, we want to get you on campus. We want to get things in motion. Then as, you know, a day, maybe even a week go by, things go a different direction. Whether it be your transfer board, you know, you decide to decide to move on to a different player. The player decides to move in a different direction. You know, there are a ton of reasons why some of these things, while the interest could be there at first, sometimes they could fizzle out yeah. as well. So, again, you know, we mentioned it with Herring about, you know, he's got to get to campus and then we can see where things are really at. Same deal with Conga, I would say. While Herring does make a little bit more sense, giving Penn State's needs and, you know, his track record of production, Conga's kind of in a different boat. And that way, it's just one of those ones where if the staff likes what it sees and it sees a potential fit and it sees a guy who could help them, they're going to do their exploration. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Again, just early names to know. Uh, and, and again, there's there's going to be growth at, at, at the target board and at some of these positions for Penn State's going to have options. And you don't want to wait. If you, if you even have an inkling that you might be interested in a guy, you can't really afford not to reach out on day one. It's just the nature of the transfer portal. You can't wait and give the guy 72 hours and then say, hey, we'd also like to get involved. So um, some, some different dynamics in play as, as we peel back the layers of the, the spring transfer portal window, which we think – will continue to intensify off to a relatively quiet start compared to some of the anticipated uh, movement um, to this point. And Tyler, speaking of the transfer portal, Penn State basketball program utilizing it to its advantage as well. Today, picking up Nebraska transfer wing Eli Rice uh, out of IMG Academy's post-grad program. He has roots as a Tennessee high school hooper, uh, but he's a guy now going to be making a move within the conference joining Penn State. He's the third transfer portal pickup for them since March 30th. And he's somebody that went out uh, to Nebraska, viewed as a high trajectory upside kind of player. Fred Hoiberg said back in October that he thinks he could be a future superstar uh, when it's all said and done. Ultimately, if that happens, it won't happen with the Nebraska Cornhuskers. But What's your instant reaction to the pickup of a player who averaged about four and a half points, uh, a rebound and a half in 10 minutes of action for Nebraska for 19 contests last year until he suffered an ankle injury in late January? This might be my favorite portal get of the offseason for Penn State. I think the upside is just really off the charts here. You know, you touched on this when we were discussing Eli Rice earlier this afternoon. You know, he's still kind of. I don't want to say newer to basketball, but he only played two years at his original high school before deciding to go on to a prep year at IMG Academy, which, by the way, we've touched on this before, but it's definitely worth reiterating. Mike Rhodes has ties at IMG Academy, and we've heard that played a pretty big part in this one coming together. You know, Rice having that level of comfort with Penn State. So that relationship worked in Penn State's favor here. I just think Rice, there is so much good basketball ahead of him. There is still so much for him to tap into on the development front. This kid can shoot the rock. There's no doubt about that. 41%, 40, I believe he was close to 42% from the field as a freshman, 37% from three. Hit some pretty big shots at, in key spots for Nebraska at times last season. His, his freshman year kind of went off the rails when he suffered a high ankle sprain put him out for a couple months. He was back towards the NCAA tournament, but at that point, you know, it was late in the game for him. He didn't get the chance to suit up in the postseason. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, kind of I, I did some gauging of the reaction when Rice left. It seemed to catch Nebraska fans off guard, and they shared the similar sentiment that he's flashed his potential and he could be a potential rotation piece. And, you know, in our news article, our breaking story on Rice, there are quotes from Nebraska players just heaping praise upon rice his skill set his upside his ability to shoot the ball it's is it's kind of different compared to what pense has gone out and done in the portal so far this offseason going out and getting kachi enzi and yannick niederhauser were also committed earlier this week to stretch big from northern illinois you know it's different but these guys are all the same in the sense that they've got multiple years of eligibility and a ton of upside and quite frankly this is the way mike Rhodes wants to build his program what you saw last season, that was done out of necessity, going out and loading up in the portal. You know, he inherited a roster that was ravaged in the portal following the departure of Micah Shrewsbury. So he had to go out and get guys on the fly. What you're seeing now between the high school recruiting class of four guys that Penn State really likes in the three-man portal hall to date, this is kind of the balance that Mike Rhodes has wanted to achieve when it comes to roster building from day one. He has essentially in an off season's time, 
gone out and built a young core to pair with an already veteran group of Ace Baldwin, who, you know, all indications are continue to be positive regarding his re- potential return to Penn State next season. You got Ace Baldwin, Puff Johnson, DeMarco Dunn, Nick Kern, Zach Hicks. So you have that balance that Rhodes has been searching for from day one. He was an, unable to attain it from day one due to reasons and circumstances that were far beyond his control, but now he kind of has it. And I think that makes the makeup of this roster moving forward very, very interesting. Now there's one more spot available regarding a scholarship. And, you know, the desire, it just seems to be throughout the offseason, it's been go out and get a guard who can play off the ball, off the ball, excuse me, and fill it up in the scoring column. Given some of the youth and upside and, you know, just relative raw skills that some of the guys Penn State has gone out and gotten the portal, it seems like that off the ball option might be a little bit more of a veteran player to pair in the backcourt. We're going to have to see what comes about on that front. You know, there's already been a couple of pursuits of guys with multiple years of collegiate experience. Jordan Takak goes off the board to Rutgers. Marcus Warren go, or Warwick goes off the board to Missouri. So you've already seen Penn State involved with some older guys at the two-guard spot, and that's what I expect to continue moving forward. But Eli Rice is a pretty good get. I think Penn State, all things considered, has had itself a really, really good offseason. Rice bringing three years of eligibility to campus. And as you mentioned, came off the bench cold and, and came up with some key shots and, and wins over Kansas State, Michigan State last season. And I like that you're getting a blend of someone who's clearly a younger player, two years of high school experience, the post-grad year at, I, at uh, IMG, and then a year under his belt in Nebraska now. But he's still not 20 years old until this August. So he's young considering you know where he is in that process. And additionally, um, he has some experience. I know it was abbreviated because of the injury and and he didn't really get beyond 10 to 12 minutes on average in any Big Ten night. But he does know what it's like to have to step up and hit a shot against a high caliber opponent. He knows what it's like to be called off the bench in those moments. So you're not getting a guy who spent just a year behind the scenes entirely with the program and now needs a change of scenery. He has some seasoning coming with him, but he also has that upside that you talked about, and that seems to be a common theme uh, for this class. You mentioned uh, Niederhauser. While we're on the subject, uh, before we move on from basketball and and get back to the blue-white recruiting impact, um, what is the story with him? I mean, he's 6'11", long, uh, looks like a big-time maybe rim defender for this team. Yannick Niederhauser, international prospect. Where is he from? I know he's from Northern Illinois, but there's a little bit of a backstory there. Yeah, Swiss native, comes over to the States to play at Northern Illinois. Played sparingly as a freshman. His role increased as a sophomore, and you saw more of what Penn State sees in him from a fit perspective. Stretch big, who could really space the floor, play off the bounce a little bit with the ball in his hand. So he's not one of those bigs who's going to go to the perimeter, and if he can't get his shot right off the rip, he's going to be lost in space and become a liability. You know, Penn State's been looking for a big who could really stretch things down, space the floor, and open things up so it could play a more open brand of ball offensively, and that's what Niederhauser brings to the table offensively. You know, his shot is still coming along. He was only shooting 29% from three as a sophomore, but the thought and the sentiment that I've received is, you know, his stroke just continues to get better and it's going to continue to improve. And at the very least, it's good enough to keep defensive honesties, defenses honest. They know he could, he could shoot the basketball if he has to. And that's a big part of, you know, just opening things up for Rhodes and his staff. Defensively, we're talking about pretty good rim protector, just a shade over two blocks per game in limited minutes. So, you know, even if he's not giving you a whole lot on the offensive end of the floor for whatever reason, if he's struggling on a given night, he's going to be a presence in the paint. So potential two-way impact player here for Penn State. Good stuff, Tyler. Uh, we, we will see what Penn State does with, with a little more room, just a little more room uh, for the transfer portal class and, and what kind of piece they can add and um, uh, things coming together. Certainly a lot less frantic than the situation last late spring when, when Mike Rhodes is trying to basically rebuild an entire roster, as you referenced. All right, let's go back. It's It's been a few days, but the impact of the blue-white events on Saturday is still reverberating for Penn State on the recruiting trail, Tyler. Uh, I know we've gotten a ton of feedback between our network reporters like Brian Doan and Alan True, and of course you working hard at lines247.com. I hope people have taken advantage of our current ongoing 50% off VIP subscription sale. 50% off gets you in the door full year of VIP 
access. It's a great time to do it, not only with the transfer portal, the recruiting world being open up uh, and we got official visits on the horizon and recruiting camps. But when we get into preseason camp in August, you already know that you're covered at 50 percent the rate for the entire football season. And, and that's when you get the really good stuff. But it doesn't stop over at lines 247com So quick pitch there. But let's go back to that coverage, Tyler. And, and we got a few names that we wanted to get to. There were so many prospects on campus along with their families. Not the most beautiful day to, to, to showcase Beaver Stadium. Uh, would have liked one of these 70 degree days to, to be available on that Saturday, but it wasn't the case. We're going to work our way through and let's start with the player who locked in a follow-up official visit um, in Adam Chauvelin. Yeah, Pennsylvania native, prepping at St. Thomas More, Connecticut. Made it back to campus for the first time in a little while now. Caught up with Dion Barnes. Barnes made it clear to him that he wants to continue building that relationship. He's going to get down to watch him work out during the evaluation period. And he's got that official visit scheduled for that final weekend of June, June 21st through the 23rd. The interior defensive line board, it's an interesting place right now. You know, Trent Wilson going off the board to Oklahoma. Darren I. Kenningbaum going off the board to Georgia. So that leaves you with a couple guys remaining. And it's not going to be a bigger defensive tackle class in general, given what was signed last cycle. But it leaves you with a couple of guys with official visits locked in. Jarquez Carter, the Florida native, he's going to be on campus June 7th through the 9th. Randy Adarica from Miami Central made it to campus for the blue-white game. He's going to be on campus June 14th through the 16th for his official visit. And now Shovlin is the latest guy to lock one in June 21st through 23rd. And, you know, just as kind of a reminder, the, the official visit structure that Penn State's been going for, you know, the guys, most of the guys at least who are visiting that final weekend of June, you know, you kind of have to wait and see where some of the chips ahead of them fall regarding, you know, commitments to either Penn State or commitments elsewhere that could either open the door or close the door on certain guys. But Penn State, it's had its eye on children for a while. You know, he's camped. We've seen him at multiple camps on campus, and, you know, the staff has been in contact with him. It was his first visit in a while, but that contact has remained in place, and now the official visit's locked in. We'll keep tabs on, on his situation. There's one crystal ball pick in. It's from earlier th this month. It's from Brian Doan, and it points in the direction of Stanford. Uh, recently joined the ACC or making that move this year as, as college football changes all over the place. Um, a, a few other names to get to here, and and, and one of them, Jaden Lofton, is someone that I believe we we discussed a little bit in previewing this event and where Penn State was standing and how his 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 uh, situation was developing. Uh, really impressive size, uh, a blend of that size, speed, edge rusher uh, out of New Jersey, Somerville High School. Where is Penn State and Lofton now that this has been taken care of and he's gotten to campus and those conversations has been, have been had? Well, Penn State feels pretty good about where it's at with Lofton right now. And a lot of this visit, you know, when he visited for that spring practice earlier in April, it was an opportunity for just for him to really get more familiarity familiarity with how Penn State does things on the practice field, the way the staff coaches up its guys. But he brought his dad with him to the blue-white game, and he got the chance to meet Deion Barnes. And, you know, really just the relationship got more in-depth while Lofton was on campus for this blue-white weekend visit. So, yeah, Penn State definitely feels pretty good about where it is at with the New Jersey standout right now. You know, he's got some other official visits locked in that he's going to make before he makes it to Penn State during that final official visit weekend of June. Nitting lines are feeling pretty good about this one right now, though. A couple offensive linemen to get to, and, and both of them from a little bit to the south. We'll start with Carter Scruggs out of Loudoun County, Virginia. Uh, 2026 prospect, unlike the other two we've been discussing. Uh, so not as much of, of a pressing situation on the timeline, but he's one of those guys where it could get late in a hurry in his recruitment because he's got the likes of Georgia and Alabama on that offer sheet already. What did he make of his trip to Happy Valley? He told me Penn State's one of his top church top choices early on in his process which is notable you know he's really expressed a pretty strong liking of the staff namely Phil Troutwin and you know this last visit for him it was his first real taste of a game day atmosphere inside Beaver Stadium you know granted it was the spring game but he was just still really really impressed with all the energy that the fans brought to the building that day and he had a huge really effusive in his praise for the fan base and that's an environment he could see himself playing in one day so it's still early now there are a couple of virginia offensive line penn state's in with really well scruggs is one of them darius gray from richmond st christopher school 
another guy Penn State's doing really well with in that 2026 group in Virginia. So, uh, you know, Phil Charlton's doing a pretty good job in that state. But right now, the focus back to Scruggs. He's going to be a name to keep an eye on moving forward. He fits that profile of what Penn State looks for out of its tackles, and he's high on the knitting lines early on. But, again, that offer list is really impressive. So he is not short on top-end schools to choose from. Yeah, and that 2026 class, we got a lot to learn about it for Penn State, but you love how it started for them. Messiah Mickens, the in-state running back, one of the premier running back prospects in the country for that 2026 cycle. He continues to gather big-time offers as well. Um, I, I promise more offensive linemen. We're going to get into them now. 2025 class, a couple here to get to. Michael Gibbs has been Relatively top popular topic of conversation for us lately, Tyler, because he's made some visits. He's had a few scheduled. Um, he is considered a top 50 interior offensive lineman out of Wilmington, North Carolina. Things just continue to get more comfortable between him and the Nittany Lions? Yeah, they're definitely comfortable. His relationship with Phil Charlton is probably the best of any coach involved in his recruitment. He really just loves the staff. He had a really unique experience during blue white week and you know his family he and his family met they Ione, who you know has those samoan roots gibbs grandmother is from that region so they had a lot to talk about culturally you know coming across the country to play at penn state what has that been like so there was some pretty valuable insight game there again you know we talked about this leading up to blue white game with gibbs where are things going to go he didn't talk to the staff about an official visit but you know could that change moving forward it's, again, it's one of those situations where you're going to have to monitor what goes on on that offensive line board. You know, the priorities are elsewhere. We're going to talk to one, talk about one of those guys who's kind of moving up the pecking order in that regard here in a few minutes. But Gibbs, you know, maybe as things progress and, you know, maybe some guys go off the board elsewhere, Penn State's focus shifts elsewhere, depending on what happens with other guys. Maybe Gibbs is an official visit candidate in the summer. We're going to have to wait and see. I know the riser you're referencing, Nolan yeah. Davenport uh, out of Washington High School in Ohio, uh, somebody whose offer list is starting to feature more of the power four flavor in a hurry um, and a six foot six. One of those lighter tackles that we've seen Penn State target and, and sign lately, six, six, 260 plus pound range right now as a, as a rising high school senior. Um, where is he on Penn State's board? How aware does everyone need to be of Nolan Davenport at this stage? Almost definitely aware. He's kind of been moving up since he picked up that offer from Penn State earlier this spring. You know, he visited for a junior day, didn't get an offer during that visit, but contact remained in place, and he gets back for the blue-white game. You know, we haven't been able to track down a ton of feedback coming out of that visit, but we do know that he is an official visit candidate for Penn State. That's not something that has been scheduled yet, to our knowledge, but it is something that, excuse me, has been discussed between Davenport and Penn State. Lots of like about him from a prospect profile, you know, borderline four-star recruit who he, you know, we talk about the profile. He's got the athleticism that Phil Trotman loves out of his tackles. He's got the size, so definitely a fit in that regard. Again, you know, what happens with some of the guys ahead of him, you know, the Zaire Addisons, the Malachi Goodmans, you know, those guys, but Davenport has remained in contact with the Penn State staff, and it wouldn't surprise me if the official is locked in here soon. He's the number 29 offensive tackle in 24-7 sports rankings for the 2025 cycle. And, oh, by the way, you talk about an intimidating presence on the mound. This guy's also a pitcher, six foot six, 260, touching a, apparently mid to high 80s with his fastball. Good luck uh, to, to the batters who face him this spring. Uh, Tyler, let's finish up with a couple of 2026ers out of the same program St. John's down in Washington, D.C. That is a college football prospect factory on an annual basis. And these are two guys coming down that pipeline now. Uh, again, rising juniors going into next year. So a couple of years to figure things out. They're going to sign their, their letters of intent in December 2025. But Tariq Boney, uh, an edge rusher, and then Hakeem Satterwhite, a defensive back. Both of these guys profile as premier prospects in the mid-Atlantic region in that 2026 cycle. Then they've definitely been made to feel like early priorities for the staff. Akeem Satterwhite was very clear in that to me when I got the chance to talk up to him. Terry Smith is very involved in that recruitment, and there has been a lot of prioritization there early on. And he's really appreciated Smith's efforts with him, you know, just maintaining that consistent level of contact and it being clear to him how much he is wanted in State College. It was a good visit for him, good visit for Tariq Boney as well. It wasn't his first visit of the spring. Unlike Satterwhite, it was his first trip to State College in a little bit. He had visited multiple times as an underclassman, but this is his first one following his sophomore season. Boney was back on campus for the second time in less than a month. 
He visited during the week on March 23rd, picked up an offer from the Nittany. Well, he's been on the board with an offer from the Nittany Lions, picked one up during the winter. That was his first visit following the offer. He prioritizes getting back to Penn State again for the spring game, and it was really just another positive experience for hell for him. Really rave reviews for Deion Barnes so far. Love the way the defensive line looked during the blue-white game. So those two, I mean, it goes without saying the regional guys, so you got to keep an eye on them moving forward in that 2026 cycle. But I expect them both to remain priorities for Penn State at their respective positions. Just a sample size here of the blue-white coverage that Tyler Calvaruso and company provided from the recruiting angle over at lines247.com. Hopefully you've been on the site in recent days checking out all the feedback coming from Saturday's event, and there'll be more to come. And, and, and Tyler, looking forward, we're going to get to uh, Brandon Short, former All-American linebacker and current Penn State Board of Trustees member in just a moment. But let's finish with you here. How would you kind of summarize what Penn State accomplished over the course of its spring practice recruiting window and what's happening now, what's happening next on the recruiting trail for the Nittany Lions? You know, since the commitment of Alvin Henderson leading up to the spring game, it kind of mirrored last spring in the sense that there was a little bit of a drought on the commitment front. Some top guys went elsewhere. You know, I mentioned Wilson and I can't ignore and Matt Zollers decides to go elsewhere. He commits to Missouri. So there are some losses on the trail, and that leads to the fan base getting a little bit, you know, antsy, you know, wondering where things are heading. But the fact of the matter remains that once official visit season rolls around, Penn State is still going to be in a good spot to close on some of its top targets on both sides of the ball. So while the spring wasn't, you know, commitments weren't a plenty or anything like that, it was still a productive spring for Penn State in the sense that it kept itself in a good spot with some of its top targets. Some of those guys made it back to campus for a visit. Some didn't, but contact remained in place. And, you know, Penn State just really kept chipping away at those recruitments. But, you know, nothing, not a whole lot doing on the commitment front, but I don't think there's any reason to, you know, panic or worry about the direction of this class. Because I think we fielded similar reaction last year, and the class wound up pretty good, I'd say, in the end. You know, I think Penn State's in a position to welcome in another top 15 class, assuming some recruitments we think are going to break Penn State's way do indeed break Penn State's way once official visit season rolls around. So, uh, you know, the spring was what it was. I think Penn State did a really good job with the 2026s, too. I think they did a good job really heightening the interest in some of their top targets on that 26 board. And obviously 25 is the focus, but it's always good to uh, get a head start in the future and build those relationships up with the underclassmen or high in your pecking order and high on your board at whatever position they may play. So these are all things that you need to take into account when evaluating the spring. Now, once the summer rolls around, I think, you know, if you're a Penn State fan, you're probably going to be in for a little bit more fun in terms of movement with guys going off the board in Penn State's favor. But, you know, the spring's over. Now it's on to monitoring these official visits, seeing what comes of those. And, and as James Franklin alluded to in this post-game uh, press conference Saturday, Coach is hitting the road again this yes. week as well. So a chance to go and, and go face-to-face, -face, get a little bit of a fresh look, um, and ultimately come back and recalibrate yourself on that target board uh, for what is going to be a pivotal few months for both the 2025 class, where you're trying to close on it, and the 2026 class, where uh, through those kind of trips and through the upcoming prospect camps, you're really trying to get a strong look at what the top tier of targets is going to look like for you among those rising high school juniors. Tyler, appreciate all your perspective here and over at lines247.com. Always fun talking recruiting with you. Yep. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me back on. Uh, we covered a lot of good ground here today. This episode continues with a familiar face here on the podcast. He's been on a couple times, maybe a voice if you're not tuning in on YouTube. But Brandon Short had an All-American career on the football field with Penn State, has gone on to success in the business field after a lengthy NFL career. But he has circled back to his roots here in Happy Valley, currently serving on the Board of Trustees and currently in the thick of a re-election campaign to remain on the Board of Trustees. We welcome Brandon back to the Lions 24-7 podcast right now. Welcome back. Well, uh, well, thanks for having me, Tyler. That, that was a, a great introduction, and it was so good. It makes me feel like I wish you were my agent. I still might be playing. <laughs> I always tell people I'm the same age as Tom Brady, so it's not like I'm it's not that far off. <laughs> that's, good, that's good perspective right there. Um, and, and 1999, All-American season with Penn State, 
goes on, plays for a while in the NFL. We've had Brandon on before. We've talked about that background. We're going to pick your brain on Penn State football because I know you just got to look like the rest of us in Beaver Stadium on Saturday at the Blue-White game. But 25 years later, after you wrap up your Nittany Lions career, you know, here you are remaining involved on campus and you're motivated to stay with that. Can you kind of talk us through what you've learned through serving on the university's board of trustees thus far before we get into why you're running for a reelection? Yeah, I guess. I mean, that's a, that's a broad subject because, you know, being Penn State is um, a massive, complex you know, institution. And when you get behind the scenes, you realize how great Penn State really, really is. Um, you know, I love Penn State and, you know, I'm running for reelection because I want to give back to university that has done so much for me. You know, it's taken me from being a poor inner city kid in a housing project in McKeesport and through what I learned at, at Penn State and through the strength of the Penn State community. Now, you know, I'm a global financier. Um, and to say what, what I've learned is that, you know, we do a, a lot of great things at Penn State. You know, however, sometimes our size, you know, can be a challenge to, to, to moving expeditiously and adapting to get things done quickly. Um, you know, in an old business school, they used to say it's tough to turn a barge around in the river, uh, which is true. But Penn State is an amazing place. And, you know, we, we have a ton of potential that's yet to be realized. I'm curious, Brandon, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the evolving nature of college athletics and it changes every single day. And we're just got, uh, you know, s some news surfacing from the NCAA as I was sitting down to record with you and we've got a lot of different things to hit on, but I think a lot of our listeners out there, a lot of people who follow Penn state football closely, they want to know what NIL is going to mean for right now for 2025's roster moving forward. And now that we have a transfer portal window open and there's a lot of conversation about roster retention, not just going out and getting players, but making sure guys are staying on your roster. Um, what do you make of the opportunity here for Penn State and for all schools to be able to directly work with athletes moving forward as long as the NCAA approves this, we think they will, and they will be able to actually kind of tailor and navigate a plan together rather than having to be technically separate from the student athletes and, and the NIL plan? Well, I, I haven't seen what's been, you know, what's been announced um, publicly. So it's unclear. I have to be you know, careful here for what I speak about. But, you know, it, it, it NIL, the way it is today, even with the changes with the, I guess, to propose being able to work with with the schools and actually bringing the NIL um, collectives inside of the university or working alongside, no matter what that process is today, it's going to be different a year from now and a, a year later. And the most important thing to keep in mind is we, we need to be able to play within the rules, whatever they may be today, and be able to adapt quicker or as quickly or as our, our opponents or will be left behind. And I like to think that Penn State is on the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, we started off a little bit slowly with, with NIL because it, you know, it wasn't in our DNA. The concept of actually paying a player was something that was a little bit challenging. But now, um, you know, Happy Valley United has, you know, come together and they're, they're starting to hit a hockey stick in their performance and the way that they've been delivering um, for the university. So the, 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 way that the, the way that it is today, it won't be that way tomorrow. Um, you know, it's, as Penn Staters, we have our challenges with, with the NCAA, but I do put the blame like directly you know, at their feet because the NCAA hasn't stepped in and put guardrails around it. They're, they're, they're concerned about maintaining their whatever amount of control they have, and they're, they're, there needs to be some control over a player just – transferring and leaving after you know being with being at the school for um two months now i support player mobility i support players being paid obviously you know as a player myself but there has to be some like guardrails when you're investing in a young man's future a young woman's future um that 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 you know that they just can't up and leave we had you on last spring brandon and and on this subject um you know, same kind of time of year, the portal is about to open again. And but now it's kind of ramped up, obviously, to a different level. The, the volume is at a different level around this. And you were kind of sounding the alarm last year about maybe Penn State's readiness 
and willingness to embrace what was about to happen in college football and what it was going to be required if your expectations were for college football playoff contention, what was going to be required for the rest of the year. Um, where is that? Has the meter been moved, in your opinion, over the last 365 days? Yeah. Uh, so Joe Paterno used to always say either you get better, you get worse, you don't stay the same because you're, you're, the competition is constantly moving. You know, like just to today, there there was a, an article out that said Ohio State spent 34 millions on its players and coaches this year. Thirty four million dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, we're still going to kick the snot out of them. When we get out on the field and line up and play, you know, because we got superior coaches and players. However, that, that is that's a significant hill to climb. You know, last year they were talking we were talking about 13 million, you know, for like for the players, which has probably ticked up a little bit. Um, and now, you know, that that, it, that is a massive number, um, you know, that, that we need to be in a place where we don't need to match that number. We, we need to be able to give, you know, our coaches and our staff, you know, the tools they need to be able to, to get, to give people an opportunity to come. If somebody say they're going to offer you the like $2 million and versus someone saying that they can't offer you anything, you might not have a choice. But if they, if it's comparable or somewhere close, I think I, I take the Pepsi challenge against Ohio State all day, every day for what Penn State has to offer with in terms of an institution, the education you get and, and the alumni base and support you have come joining the Penn State family. What would you view as the primary obstacles uh, right now and, and in a position of leadership? I know you want to maintain that position um, within your control and, and what you see maybe within the scope of this particular university, the NCAA and, and nationwide. It's a, it's a whole large conversation, but here with, within the parameters of Penn State athletics, Penn State football, what are the obstacles that you see directly kind of in front as you try to clear them and move forward? Well, uh, it's it's. Our, our geographic location is a bit of a challenge. I mean, USC, um, Miami, you know, even Georgia, which is right next to the near you know, Atlanta, you know, they have the advantage over actually Tuscaloosa or State College or some of the some of the schools that are located in more rural areas because there's not large corporate sponsors that are on the or that are right there at the front door of the university. However, Penn State, you know, we we're, we have the number one school for CEOs you know, in, in, in the country. You know, we have the largest alumni base in the country. So what it's going to take for us, for us is to do a little bit more outreach and a little bit more education than those schools like a USC or Miami or Georgia who have, um, who have big, large corporate sponsors at their, at their, at their doorstep. Um, obviously, there's a lot more uh, involved with being on the BOT than just keeping your eye on NIL. So let me ask you this. When you view kind of your platform and we'll talk about who you're running alongside and why momentarily. But when you view what you're standing for here in your reelection campaign, what are those pillars? The biggest challenge that Penn State faces is affordability so that the middle class people can afford to attend Penn State. And there's revenue and there's cost and there's a trade off between cuts and you know, being able to still provide the same quality or even better quality Penn State education. Um, there's challenges at the state um, and, and there's but there, there is opportunities there as well in terms of filling Commonwealth campuses seats, monetizing our revenue, our, our research revenue and in cost efficiency. So that affordability is the big one. Um, our school ranking. That we need to our school ranking should affect should reflect the true value of a Penn State education. There's structural elements along the, that are in that ranking that along with the Commonwealth campuses, and you know we're working on addressing that. And then you know honoring the past and and, and investing in the future, and that that goes for athletics, and that goes with the the broader university is making making the right type of investments that gives us the return ROI that for you know the the for the majors and the the opportunities for our students to go out and get great jobs. You are running on a slate and I'm, and I'm just always curious when you're willing to put your face alongside someone else's, your name, your brand alongside someone else's, you must have pretty strong convictions about them. So 
Can you tell me about the two that you are running with? Uh, you can vote for all. You can vote for all three, or you can vote for just one. You don't have to vote for all three in a bunch, but I think they'd probably prefer you vote all three. Brandon, can you tell yeah. me about these guys? We had one of them on about two or three weeks ago, and Carl Massive, a fellow former All American on the football field. Yeah, I, I, I'm running with Steve Wagman and Carl Nassib. You know, Steve Wagman is the former president of the Penn State Alumni Association. He's a current um, Penn State board member. He has 40 years of experience in the healthcare industry. 40% of our budget is Penn State Health. Steve is the only member of the board that has a health background. So, so to lose him, we lose the expert on the largest portion of our budget that's outside of the outside of the, the main university. Um, and, and Carl, look, this job is about character and judgment. And uh, Carl is a uh, uh, twelve out of ten on both of those points. You know, Carl, he's the first openly gay NFL player, so that takes a lot of guts. I tell you, you mean you have to stand up and stand up for what's right. But beyond that, he's the CEO of his own tech startup. He's been in Forbes for advising players on how to manage their money and cash management. And he's a very smart guy that is, would be the youngest member of our board. And we need a younger outreach so that, that old, old folks like myself aren't just running the show. We need people to have that, that fresh view. Uh, you mentioned uh, Carl and, and, and his character and, and his background, and we covered a lot of that when he was on this podcast. Really, my, my first conversation with him, and I, I came away learning a lot about it. I hope people caught that a couple of weeks ago. But he told us as well that, that you were the guy who kind of scouted him out uh, and, and to talk about this initially. I think it was last year. He came back to his first game at Beaver Stadium ever since he left. He, you know, he was just retired. It was one of those September matchups. You run into each other on the sideline. All of a sudden, he gets a ping. Why did you see him as a fit? And ultimately, you know, he, he said he had to do some research and, and gather information and data on whether he wanted to really invest himself in this. So can you tell me where you saw Carl and the Board of Trustees as a, as a good match? Yeah, I, I, well, first of all, what, what I saw that the, the guts that it took to come out. And I saw that as an NFL player, and I know how challenging that is because there could be a, there's a lot of homophobic homophobia in, in the NFL locker rooms. And I, I respected him for having the guts to come out. And when I spoke to him, when I met him on the sidelines, I saw that he was so much more than that. You know, he, he talked about like the the him being the, a, a player rep. You know, with, with Tampa and the collective bargaining agreement and, and negotiating a collective bargaining agreement and representing players. Um, he talked about financials that, like security and how the how you should just live off of your, your your endorsements and not just live not live off your 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 check. I mean, your your monthly check. Um, and, and was so impressed with him. You know, I, I, I thought that he would be a good fit. Then, but then I went out and I talked to other people that knew him, and that, that everything that I thought about my initial judgment about his character, you know, was confirmed. I thought that we needed somebody, a younger, a strong, young voice on the board, and I couldn't think of a better person to do it than Carl. So, more than seven hundred and fifty thousand Penn State alumni, as far as I understand, eligible to participate in this election, which is currently happening, goes through May second, but. Really interesting point that you made uh, off air, uh, sending me some information, 25,000 less than that people actually participate in this thing. I know people have opinions across the, I'm sure the Penn State alumni network, uh, but maybe a lot of them don't even realize an election is happening right now. If this is new information to somebody, or maybe they just, for one reason or another, haven't been participating in the past, can you talk them through the process? Because as far as I understand it here on April 17th, as we record, there's still a chance for them to dive into this thing and make their voice heard. There, there, there's still plenty of time. And we'll always say that like being on a board is like being an official. Nobody notices you until you mess up. Right. But it is the most important element of the university. We, we hire and the president, we hold the president accountable and set the strategic direction for the university, um, which, is, which is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Um, voting used to be challenging. 
We're used to have the old voting process used to be you have to put your email in so, uh, into a, a website and they would send you an email and you could vote. Now voting is so easy. You, you can go to PennStateVotes.com, PennStateVotes.com and just put your, st- your name, the year you graduated and your school and you can vote. It only takes two minutes to two minutes to vote. And it, it matters. It's so important. I'm asking you, I, I would prefer that you that you vote for Brandon Short, Carl Nassif and Steve Wagner. But even if you don't, I prefer that you be a part of the process. We have 750,000 eligible voters. Last year was a high turnout when we had 25,000 people voting. It's so important that people get engaged because it matters. You know, you're, you're, you're complaining about if you're upset about ticket prices, you're upset about affordability, if you're upset about ranking, if you're if you if you want to have a voice into things that are happening at the university, there are people that represent you. And I'm one of them. So and, and you hold us accountable, hold me accountable. But, you know, but, but we need your support to get elected. Last year, I'm going to circle back real quick again. You kind of described and then you talk about when it's an election year, there's going to be debate. There's going to be dialogue. Maybe it gets contentious. That's at a national level. That's at a university wide yeah. election. Yeah. Um, but but you talked about, you know, kind of there's there's sides to the equation. And, and last year you felt like those sides were maybe creating a little bit of a schism that could maybe hurt the the growth of the football program, hurt the growth of the athletic department. Have you seen things mend a bit in that realm? Are things still kind of just status quo in that regard? Or you know, kind of give us the update there, because I know some of your comments on this podcast last year on that particular subject, you know, stir some attention. Yeah, well, the things um, – are better on that end, so because there were individuals that were working to undermine Penn State football and the unit and you know the broader athletic department that were associated with the uh, the collective. Now they're no longer associated with the collective, but they do have a voice, and they're running candidates in this race right now. And you know, that they are being backed candidates that are being backed by the same people that were working to undermine the university. Um, which is a big reason why I went out and re- recruited Carl because I thought he was great and we needed somebody to counteract, you know, what we were seeing last year. So it's the same battle, but there's just less talk about it, less attention on it. Um, but, you know, the, the people that have taken positions that are anti, you know, football and, you know, I'm doing everything that I can to, to try to prevent that from happening. Now, the university is much more than football. It's much more than athletics. It's so much bigger. But I think that they're on the wrong side of most of those issues. Uh, in terms of leadership, Pat Kraft really in the spotlight for Penn State. He's now a couple years into his tenure. Um, can, can you kind of just evaluate what you've seen and maybe your interactions from him, what you've gathered from the impact he's made on the university and at such a, at such a pivotal point in college athletics? Well, look, look. Pat is a ball of energy. Pat, he's a linebacker. Not only is he a linebacker, he's a walk-on linebacker. So he's gritty. He's tough. He's straightforward. He's honest. Um, he, he has like everything that you could want in, in an athletic director. He's super personable, but he's he's, he's brought a, a level of creativity in the way that we think about things in terms of our contracts and in terms of how we, we're, we're organizing the, the athletic department. Um, he's hired a bunch of great people, you know, with with Vinny and and a bunch of the, and the rest of his team. So I, I'm I'm super excited about. Pat, I think that he's done you know a great job you know since he's been here, and you know I think that the sky's the limit. You know, with, with more time with him at the helm to really put his fingerprints on the entire athletic department, um, it, it's fantastic. Brent, can we talk a little bit of football now? Is that is that good with you? Let's get it. Let's line, let's line up and go. <laughs> I thought so. I thought so. So you were just in Beaver Stadium on Saturday. We were as well. Good chance to see some extended action live for everybody except for those quarterbacks. But before we get to that, Tom Allen's now the man in that room for you that I know is near and dear to your heart, the linebacker room at Penn State University. He's running the show there. He's also the defensive coordinator. Have you had a chance to get to know Tom much yet? I know Manny Diaz was so popular around here. People are still trying to wrap their heads around a guy who spent the last seven seasons as a head coach within the same Big Ten division. Yeah, I have had a chance to spend some time with, with Tom. I, like I, I met him 
um, you know, down um, at the bowl at the Peach Bowl this year, and you know I've seen him uh, other multiple times and had 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 a chance to have conversations with him, and, and I really like his energy. I like the, his, his defensive philosophy. I mean, we had the, the number one defense in the country last year, so it's a pretty high it's a pretty high bar. But from what I've seen, that that we are right in the realm of being that that type of defense again this year. The talent that we have, and then with Tom's, you know, in, in intensity and the way that he approaches the game. You know, we have like we have linebackers, we have, we have defensive ends, and I would Abdul Carter is an absolute beast at end, and I'm I'm really excited. To, to see what he's that he's going to do at the end. We have you no know, corners that that, uh, that we got in the in the transfer portal that that are excellent players. We we'll probably have the top safety room in the country, so that that defense can be um, spectacular. It really, I mean, we, we stole it on display a bit there in Beaver Stadium, but you're right. It's not just on paper. It's a lot of guys who have done it, and, and, and we've seen it on the practice field as well. It's going to be exciting to see. You mentioned Abdul Carter. I know you were so excited about him when we've spoken in the past. What was your reaction to, to the news that, that he was moving over to defensive end and that it was really his, you know, his, his pushing to, to get over to that spot? We, we got a nice look at what it could be on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, so my, my, my reaction is it was a, gr a great move, a right move for him. Like when you look at his body type, I mean, it, like he has a neck as wide as this table and, and he has a very difficult time. I guess a, he's he probably has a difficult time being under 260. Um, so his, his size and his agility and the frankly, where he can make the most impact on a team is rushing the quarterback and then where he can make the most money for himself in the future. That's where that's, I mean, that's where you'd be as a, as a linebacker. It hurts me to say this, but you know, they, they pay those guys that are coming off the edge a lot more than they pay the guys sitting back, filling the, the, the B guy calling a huddle. <laughs> It's true. I mean, there's a reason why Micah Parsons is going to want that franchise tag at defensive end versus linebacker and and, and so on and so forth. Um, you look at this linebacker group. Curtis Jacobs has moved on. Manny Diaz has moved on. Abdul Carter is at a new position. But Kobe King is the second-year starter at Mike. And then there's been so much buzz about Tony Rojas since he got to campus last year as a freshman. He's a guy that I think we all believe, if called upon last year, could have handled a pretty significant role. Didn't need to happen. But it's here now. James Franklin told us this month he thinks production is going to skyrocket for Rojas as a sophomore. What have you had a chance to see from him and King, and and, and what do you make of, of that duo? Because those are the two guys that it sounds like are going to be at the forefront at the linebacker spot. I mean, that they, 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 they are doing an excellent job of upholding tradition of linebacker you and you know as I don't I don't take that that lightly. I mean, Rojas is the, the sky's the limit for him. What I met I met. Tony on, uh, I don't know whether it was an official visit or it was a visit. And he was on the sideline and like he was about half the guy that he is now. It looks like he gained like 40 pounds since then. And he was a little skinny. Um, and I said, oh, what, like, what position do you play? And, and he looked at me and he's like, I, I see myself like Michael Parsons. And I looked at him like, well, he, Michael Parsons was on his way to being the rookie of the year in the NFL. I was like, oh, I like where this guy's head's at. And, look, and, and from what I've seen, I mean, he's, he is well you know, on, on his way. And, and Kobe, um, he stepped up and, and become the leader of the team. You know, that, that, that Mike linebacker has to, is the, it generally has to be the focal point of that defense, the heart of the defense. So I'm proud of him and his development. Dom DeLuca, let's, let's not forget Dom. Like Dom, it was basically the highest graded like linebacker in college football last year in terms of his playmaking ability. And he's going to come. I, I'm looking for a big year out of him. You know, the, the, we have young guys, Tamir Robinson, strong, the like Tyler Elston coming back, guy rocking 4-3, you know, I got to have his back. Um, so the, the, the linebackers, the, there was a reason why – uh, Coach Franklin and Coach Allen were comfortable with moving Abdul Carter to defensive end, and it's the depth that they have at linebacker. I knew I couldn't get away with just two linebackers in that conversation. I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned DeLuca because he's a guy that's going to play a ton. He's already a special teams captain. He's so far removed from being the guy who showed up as a walk-on. Uh, he, he's been one of the more remarkable stories that Penn State's produced recently. A really cool story. I'm glad you mentioned him. Thank you. Uh, but, but Brandon, when you, when you look at this team in totality, what you saw on Saturday, maybe what you've picked up from some from some trips to facilities during this offseason. What are the vibes you're picking up about this particular version of the Nittany Lions? And what did you personally see on Saturday that got you excited for when they get back on the field come August? 
Well, it, it, the, the spring game, it's always very difficult to take anything out of the spring game because they pare down the offense. They don't want to show very much because, you know, you got Michigan sitting in the stands watching the game, watching the tape. Yeah. Um, so they pare it down. And it, 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 you really see the development where, where you see it happen in some of the practices. Um, I guess it, for, for the young people who've never been on the field at Beaver Stadium, it's it's a much bigger deal. But, you know, a lot of the, the starting offensive line didn't play. Dom, they had Dom out. And so it, it's challenging to sort of say what, what I saw on Saturday. But what I've seen at practice is a confidence. You know, I see like Drew has, has cut weight. It looks like he, he, he looks like he's much more athletic. Uh, I see him being much more confident in, in practice, you know, like challenging people and demanding more out of himself. Um, the, the, the running backs, I mean, they just speak for themselves. We have the top running back room in, in, in the country. Tyler Warren could be one of the top tight ends in America. We just got Flika, um, Fleming that is coming in. That's this bit this brought a big boost to the receiver room. Trey Wallace. I mean, that, that, that I am really excited about the team, um, excited to see what Coach K can do, you know, on the offense. I, like, I don't want to butcher his name, so we're just going to call him the offense coordinator, Coach K, uh, going forward. Um, so excited to see what those guys can do. I mean, it, 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 we're, it, it's upbeat. Um, it's a, a whole new leaf for the entire team with a new offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, and special teams coach. But they, they, they seem to be gelling well. Um, that they, they we have the, uh, an entire off season now in the summer workout for for the team to come together, and I'm looking forward to see what they can do at West Virginia. Uh, you mentioned that the board of trustees does the hiring, and James Franklin is the most prominent employee of Penn State in terms of the national spotlight. The guy who's who's got a lot of, of people talking about him in one way or the other. He's in year 11. I don't know if you can believe that, but but he's in year 11 at this point here at Penn State. Um, uh, you played for Joe Paterno. He was here a long time, uh, but a decade plus in modern college football. That's some staying power. What have you learned about James Franklin? Over that span, and more recently, how do you think? Uh, how how do you have you come to view him as as the the face of the franchise? I guess you could say here for Penn State football. Well, when 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 James first joined, I lived abroad, and I just talked to him once on on the phone, like like a, a year into when he he came on. But over time, getting to see to know him and his character, and how much he cares about the kids' development, the, the young men and women that are associated with the program, their development, you know, off the field, um, you know, I, I, I'm taken aback. I mean, just the, the, they, that locker room, although the, it, there's Joe Paterno, you know, it's tough to compare anybody to the greatest coach of all time. Full stop. So that's a, it's a high hurdle. But in terms of the type of the, the kids that they we produce, those are still Penn State kids, and I'm and I'm proud of that, and proud to call them our coach because of those type of kids. And in terms of where the program is as a whole, look, when I played at Penn State, you know, we were the number one team in the country um, for three years um, leading into leading into game one, the full full blown national powerhouse. Um, I played in one New Year's Six Bowl game where we beat Texas in the Fiesta Bowl. In the past six years, you know, we've been to four. So that, I mean, that's the state of the program. We haven't we haven't gotten to the point where we've gotten over the hump because we, I mean, we had like two of the top teams in the country right in our backyard. Um, but you know, we are a national powerhouse, and we just need to take that next step. To be able to 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 close that gap with the the Ohio States and, and and the Michigans, but I think we're really close, and you know I think that James is the guy to get us there. Let's finish with this, uh, Brandon, because um, I don't think we gave the exact details. But if people out there are saying, "Well, how do I actually vote for for anyone in this election?" Can you talk them through that process right now? That, that you can vote by going to the like going into your web browser and typing in pennstatevotes.com. That's pennstatevotes.com. It'll ask you for some basic information, your name, what school you went to, what year you graduated, and then vote for Brandon Shore, Steve Wagman, and Carl Nassib. 
Brandon, we appreciate it. Good luck to you in the election that goes through May 2nd. Hopefully we'll be seeing you around campus pretty soon, maybe on the sideline at an upcoming practice. All right, but thanks a lot. Right, great stuff from Brandon Short, uh, member of the Board of Trustees, former All-American linebacker at Penn State. Before him, we heard from Tyler Calvaruso on the Penn State transfer portal and the Penn State recruiting trail, which has been really busy of late. A lot of information from him on what went down during the Blue White weekend and those visitors on campus. For now, stepping aside, getting back to work at lines247.com and keeping our finger on the pulse of this ever-evolving transfer portal. Uh, I am Tyler Donahue. This has been the Lions 24-7 podcast.